I'm Aaron Weintraub, and this is Inside Kurdistan. There exists in Kurdistan one of the most stark generational divides that I've ever seen, and I'm not Kurdish myself, so it's difficult for me to speculate deeply on all of the intricacies of this divide, but I I would sum it up like this. I think for generations, most of Kurdistan, most Kurds, have defined success as survival. And while, of course, there are still existential threats here, that goal of merely surviving has faded somewhat and has been replaced with a much more complicated question of how to thrive in Kurdistan. And with this comes questions of employment and education and corruption, environment, and a myriad of other issues that have deeply overwhelmed youth here and, quite frankly, everywhere around the world. And the results here are very clear. There's apathy, uh, a cynicism here that has permeated the next generation and has somewhat fed to a feeling of wanting to leave Kurdistan and Iraq. Abdus Salam Medini is a specialist in youth empowerment, and he's made it his mission to try and provide a road to success for youth in Kurdistan and Iraq, which he sees as necessary for the survival of the society here. And he's not wrong. He's an extremely charismatic advocate, and his organization, the Rwanga Foundation, focuses on entrepreneurship and volunteerism, um, environmental advocacy, uh, education, of course all deeply necessary factors for the success of the next generation of Kurdistan. But rather than have a discussion about his resume and Rwanga's programs, I wanted to focus on the deeper issues of social divides in Kurdistan. Uh, Divides between age groups, uh, economic divide, social mobility, of course. And we focused on the question of how much is it the older generation's responsibility to guide youth to becoming empowered? versus the youth's responsibility to empowering themselves. And we didn't agree on everything. I think we have some fundamental philosophical differences on some things. Uh, And we navigated those differences while talking about the problems that Kurdistan is facing today. I found him to be an excellent speaker on behalf of this issue. And if you're a young person who feels angry about how things are here or angry about the problems you have to face versus the generations before, this is very much the interview for you. So with that, Here's what we talked about. Abdus Salam Madani, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Appreciate it. I wanted to start, actually, I want to just be honest and say I have a bit of a chip on my shoulders when it comes to interviewing NGOs, because I feel like in the back of my head, I um, I feel like just listing out projects that NGOs are working on, it's free publicity for them, and I get paid to do the interview, and at the end of the day, we both end up walking away benefiting from it. And the people who actually are supposed to benefit from these programs don't necessarily always benefit so much from them. And that's not necessarily because the programs themselves aren't effective. Uh, they usually are. But the problem is there's they're just no match for the greater problems in the society that these people exist in, the youth specifically for Rwanga exist in. And so I think I just want to start this out by asking what is the need or what is the issue rather in Kurdistan that a non-governmental organization has to step in and help these youth. Can you can you point to the problems that you see here? Uh, okay. Th- thank you very much for the interview. Wish you all the best in your uh, mission. And uh, I hear what you said and uh, kind of agree also. And this is one of the things that also is a challenge for me. And sometimes uh, I also ask myself, what we do, does it really matter? Is it going to do dramatic strategic changes? Sometimes I have an answer to myself that, yes, we are doing. And sometimes I say, but it's in democracy about taking actions and we need to participate. And uh, so what we do is what we can do. And there are other uh, actors on on the stadium, on the platform. So each one will try to bring what they are good at. And and the other part of the answer, there are different answers. One of those, when I see, hear, meet, receive some messages on Facebook, uh, WhatsApp face to face from some young people, specifically and other, they would say, "Oh, we saw you on TV the other day. You've been doing this. I was inspired by that line. That's or on that project when we participated. I have no faith 
even in myself. But after participating, now I have faith. I believe in myself. Or somebody would come to a job fair and he's like, well, when I came, I was uh, like, oh, let us do a tour and have some snacks and to see some people. I was not thinking that I will have a job. But then now I have a job and the job fair helped me in that one. And some of those individual stories, I know it's not a strategic deep changing the whole world, but even, let me say, saving one is good. True, the other part would say, with all the operation that you do, with all the money that you are spending, is one would be sufficient? Answer is no. But like I said, it's a couple of answers that come to me. So if I would say why this is happening, if I, I'm, I'm by the way, Interrupt me at any time that I want to interrupt. No, no, fun. it's okay. You're our guest. So, <laughs> thank you. So, for me, for stable countries, usually those different stakeholders that are participating in giving hope or doing some operations, work, etc., doing their, giving a meaning to their life, if I may say, doing their mission, it could be sufficient. Each, each group of people, there are some people who are supporting them in different ways. But in countries like us, we need to be more strategic. And this is what we are lacking. We don't have it. More complicated, we are in a transition democracy period. And a country that is rented country, until now the mentality and most of our operation and actions are building on this. The government is the father, the mother, the parents of all the nation, mm -hmm. which is not supposed to be, but this is the, this is the notion of it. This is how they operate. This, those are the expectations of the people. And 95%, is coming from the oil, mm -hmm. which is for the public, yes, but honestly, it's not. It's within the hand of the government. So they spend there. So they are the sugar daddy. So all other factors, in fact, we do small stuff comparing. But if I would design everything, uh, and uh, just hypothetically, I would say there should be a gathering that is gathering the government, the civil society, the private sector, they, the three of them, and countries like us should sit together, plan together, have a vision, and then disseminate the rule and feed the public with what exactly you are intending to do and what is the progress, if there is any progress, and if there are some deficits, they need to tell them this is why. And then, because change, development is not a Exactly. Uh, it, it will need time, definitely. Yeah. And I will say, actually, that's a struggle for even, you know, quote unquote, developed countries to be able to merge those sectors together. And like you said, this is a developing democracy. And uh, th because of that, there's so many differences between the problems of the last generation, and the problems of this generation. So yes. there's that divide as well. So uh, you're an expert on youth empowerment. What do you feel the attitude of the youth of Kurdistan is about the future here? Uh, let me add this, and you said it's a challenge for, for the developed countries. True, for us, I think it's easier because we are talking about 6 million, by the way. It's not that, that a huge number. We are talking about four governorates. I know there are challenges, but at least we didn't try it to gather all those. We're talking about maximum. All the registered NGOs are around 5,000. So the active ones could be around 100, despite of it's, uh, at least to have that will to have that strategic vision for it. Talking about the youth, and like you said, and you put it in a very uh, correct way, and the, the, the people who are leading now are not aware that things got changed. Kurdistan entered this new era of it since the beginning of the 90s, 90s. So it's not a justification for the, the leaders now to say, well, we suffered a lot to get to here. You need to understand your new generation. The person who, who born in 1991, 92, now they are 30 years old. So they have a families, kids, etc. And the change all over the country, it was uh, Iraq, 2003. And now we are in 2021. So things got changed. You cannot with the same rhetoric of 90s or even the beginning of 2000s talk. Huge changes had, had happened. And the new generation don't get this rhetoric. So all in all, what we have now, despite of who was, who is the reason of it, despite of all this, what we have now as a result whether it's a fact or a perception, despite of all this, youth are hopeless. They don't believe on now nor the future. And this is why part of it could explain the migration of the youth. I don't know if I would agree with that the youth are hopeless, actually. I think that the youth are skeptical. 
Uh, yeah, uh, I think I think the youth sure. actually do have a lot of hope about Kurdistan here. I think, okay. but you know, with all due respect, I think the youth look at organizations like Rwanda and, and other NGOs here, uh, for example, and they see a bunch of well-connected, well-educated people pushing an agenda of education and power, and they find it ironic. Uh, so do you feel like education and empowerment is a cure for the ills of the next generation, or do you believe? Uh, as many young people do here, and not just here, but in the region and quite frankly around the world, that it's more important, for example, to be well connected, to have wasta, to have money, to come from that rather. And how do you combat that? Uh, so, so three things. Let me start with the with the with the hopeless. Maybe it's, maybe it's a dictionary thing, but part of it there was a research, and it's supposed to be published very soon. And the research, despite of when you see the social media platform and the meeting and the gatherings, you would see that the youth have a lot of negative energy, let us put it this way. But they specifically said they lost the hope of now and tomorrow. And this is why they are migrating. Mm-hmm. And you, we can discuss this. So all in all, uh, and the researcher was saying, the factors of push out are more than pulling in. Uh, regarding the... Uh, Wait, how do you mean by factors pushing out rather than pulling So one of those uh, research, a lot of researchers internationally, uh, when they come to the the concept of migration, uh, organized and non-organized, in general, they talk about do- those factors. So the push out are those things that are making individual or groups in some specific period of time to be a phenomenon, not individuals. This might be everywhere, but that would make the society, specifically the youth, go out of that society slash Creating country. the diaspora. Okay. Yes. I understand. Uh, and the vice versa mm-hmm. is to pulling in, to right. make, the, make it attractive to mm-hmm. come to. The education for us as Rwanda Foundation, in fact, the beginning was that, if I would frame it with the saying of quotation of, of Albert Einstein, when he said, you cannot solve the problem with the same mentality that created it. We believe in that, and we think the reality is just a reflection of our ideas and type of actions. And the, the, again, the notion of, oh, we are victims because of etc. I think we need to skip this as, as, as Kurdistani citizens. It has been a time, and everybody got suffered through their uh, history, and we've been governing ourselves since a while. So living with the mentality of we are victims it's a, it's a bad rhetoric for now. So the reality is, is a reflection of our actions. If we need to change reality, we need to change our thinking. So education is the entry point. And future means youth. So agent of change are youth. And this is why we are focusing on education as an entry point and working with youth to have a better future. If we are with them, but want do you, to be ready. Do you feel like the youth have a victim mentality? necessarily? Or do you think that it's more that the youth look around and they see that there hasn't been enough of the society that they lived in opened up for them? Tamam. Uh, just not to forget this, by the way, there are some uh, specifications for G- Generation Z and the millennials. Mm-hmm. And it's it's universal. It's not only us. With the social media interaction, there are some common. And part of it is they are angry on everything. Mm-hmm. And they want everything to be very fast. Uh, we can argue about this, but but it's more intense here because the response from the decision makers, the the expectations from the society is much much less comparing with other uh, societies, more developed, let us say. Well, well, the victim is a mentality here. The, the general mentality here is there. So young people per se, not exactly who created that, but the rhetoric of the elders, let us say. And the culture of the society is saturated with this idea. You would hear it almost everywhere. So it's affecting, but not they they created this. And they don't have it. If I would have if I would have a, a critique on the young generation, is that partially they don't take responsibility of their life. Till now, they depend on uh, so they, they 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 don't think that their life is their own responsibility. For for anything, they wait for the and they blame the other that this is because of you and it might be the the reason because of the for example the decision maker is not providing a proper environment for them to learn more for example or not functioning well to provide job opportunities yes but the way of dealing of it they would again it's about the general sense it's not about each individual the general sense is i will wait 
and the blame and eat myself and maybe suicide and go to drugs and maybe migrate, which some of those might be a solution like migration on an individual level, but some of those is not a solution. So taking drugs will not give you a job. I would agree that there is autonomy and in individual choice, but I, I would counter by saying, again, I think this is a indicative of systematic failure. True that there is there that there is depression and 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 drug addiction and suicide and these kinds of issues affecting the youth. That's an indication of a larger systematic failure. I agree, one hundred percent. But at the same, I I have a philosophy of mine. I say usually uh, we have two paths. In my lectures training, I usually say, uh, so is it the citizens are creating the culture or the culture is creating citizens citizens? And it's both sides, in fact. So we need. So you come to a culture that is already there. So fa- the system definitely is mainly responsible of creating this ecosystem of everything, creating the culture that is feeding our minds and kind of sometimes gearing our lives also and make our life easier or more complicated. I agree with you. But at the same time, each individual is responsible on his, her life. And I bring this example. In all the situation, you would have a classroom of 20 students with the same system, same minister, ministry, same teacher, same management, same curriculum, etc. Um, and 15 of them would succeed and five of them would not fail. So the first thing that would come to the mind of those five failed students would say, well, it's because of the teacher. Curriculum is bad. The timing, we didn't have electricity. And they are right. But the first question should be for them, why 15 succeeded in the same situation and why didn't you? This is the first question. I'm not saying that the other questions are not valid. It is there. But first question should be, why did I fail? Why did they succeed? And parallel to this, because you are part of a general movement, this community society, then you have another mission. If you want to make it better for yourself and the others, you need to be there participate, be proactive, try to change it for yourself or for, for the next generation. Running away from it is not a solution. It might be a solution on an individual level, by the way. Yeah. But for the society itself, running away, if everybody would run, we will not solve it. So is it, do you believe that there's some sort of messaging that is causing the youth to think this way from the older generation? Uh because I don't think that's an idea that just sprouts in your head independently. I think that the idea of of apathy and cynicism those are that's learned behavior. I I agree, but at the same time, where is the self and individual awareness? I agree with you. It is affecting, and this is why it's two way communication. I totally agree, and this is the responsibility of the families, the school, the media, the social media, the leaders, the elites. I totally agree. Those are creating the general mentality, like Carl Jung is is referring to. I agree, and and it's a huge responsibility, ethically specifically. But at the same time, in this situation, we are so. For example, you live in LA. Let us say. And which every day you would hear there are a lot of crimes, drug dealers, etc. And this is the reality that they have with this shitty politics that they have, maybe somehow. So you cannot, and you would do. I would, I would be living in LA, and I will cr- uh, commit a, a crime, and then I will go to the court, and I was like, it's not my fault. My father didn't teach me well. The school was like that. And in each day I was hearing to those kind of news. So you cannot judge me, judge the society. And the judge wouldn't go, oh, you are right. Bring your father. I need to put him in jail. No. But there is societal factors in court judgment. Uh, so yeah. but I, I agree. But imagine you. So I am a person. You are the judge. And I'm a person, a young person living in L.A. And I killed someone. And I came to you. What would you tell me? Are you going to set me free? Because I was living in a family that they are criminals well are you in a neighborhood where self defense is a factor no no it's what no i i i participated to be part of that group and i committed i killed someone well so you joined a gang is what you're saying pardon you, so you sorry so what you're saying is you joined a gang you joined uh, yeah i okay. joined the, uh, the why a do, gang well why does someone join a gang 
I, so again, you are taking me to that part of the society is responsible. I agree with you, mm -hmm. but you cannot say it is the fault. And this is the victim mentality again. Mm -hmm. You, because where is the individual awareness? Where is the individual responsibility? At the same time, you cannot say, and this is universal, you can see it in the stories, in the movies, in our lives, not because everybody in the politics is, is corrupted. When you go there, you will say, but this is a trend. I need to be corrupted. Yeah, and it's shame for me not to be corrupted because I'm a politician. I remember a saying from Malik Hussein, he was saying, Politics is very dirty till an extent that clean people should participate. I agree with that, actually. Right. Yeah. So, so you need to go there and draw a new model to tell the people you can be a politician and an honest one. You can live in situation, but you have you have you you have a responsibility about your life. Again, am I saying that the other side is not taking any responsibility because it's an individual choice. Individual choice definitely is there. But at the same time, the elites are taking responsibility. And if you will give it another religious part of it, and 90 something percent of our society, Kurdistan society, for example, or Iraqi society, the, and in each society, religion is a huge drive. Or even from an ethical perspective, you would say, they would say, it's your responsibility as parents to raise them. Otherwise, any good deed they do, you will get a positive feedback on it or the karma thing and it come back to you or teachers or even the media. It will come back to you somehow. Bad, bad, good, good. There is this ethical responsibility. But at the same time, like I said, there is the other part of my responsibility. It's my life. So my my so how do you implement that messaging? Yeah, this is, how, this is how I say it. Usually I say, when I meet youth, I talk about them because there might be a university that can affect on the whole society. They need a plan, etc. Or one individual could affect, could send some messages. So imagine if you are not here. Now you are affecting on the dynamics, on a butterfly effect, if you will. Mm -hmm. Because without you, there might be someone else who could lead us to something else. You don't know what would happen. But you try to send positive message, at least to have a platform for people to think, to ask, to have another product to sell. An affirmation of existence. Or, or is it yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so each one is affecting on the other one. But at the end, we, so I say we have two messages. One, if you are youth, I will talk about you, how would make you survive. And we have a nice saying in, in, in the Badini dialect in Kurdish, they say, so when there is a flood, so the, the call is for a person who called Rashid, they call him Rashub. They are telling him, you need to swim by your own hands, otherwise the flood will take you. So I tell them, you need to do something for yourself. It's your life, your responsibility. Don't hang yourself on the altar of others' failures. Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility. At the same time, when I meet decision makers, I tell them, guys, you are responsible of their lives. You need to do better. But what's happening, some of the people would go to the policy and were like, it's not your fault. The people are ignorant. They don't do good thing. Environment, it's not your fault. The, 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 as well as the opposite. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We need to change this. Mm -hmm. When you talk with decision makers, you need to focus on their responsibility. When you talk to the citizen, you need to talk about their responsibility. What is happening, they meet the citizen and they're like, you are victims, it's not your fault. You have corrupted politicians and we have corrupted politicians. But what, what added value I added to talk as normal citizen to tell them anything you face, it's not your fault. You, you spell the water, you don't respect the law, uh, you use the wasta and push for it, by the way. A lot of citizens, we are individuals. Again, I understand the culture, but it cannot justify. Well, that's a huge problem here. True. I mean, but I see, see what's happening here because of the culture again. But this individual is ready to repeat the same wrong culture and try to convince me. And otherwise, he will socially punish me because mm -hmm. I'm a bad relative to him. Well, and I think that also. Uh, what you're describing here is kind of a chicken and egg situation between the people and the government exactly. that represents True. them. There's a lack of faith. And who has more responsibility for that lack of faith? I would say it's the elected officials. Uh, I would it's, say it's the people who implement that system. True. It's a tricky question. You know why? 
because if I will say it directly, our minds will go, okay, they get, it's, it's, when, you, when you go to a conflict, you usually say, so who's right? Who's right? Mm -hmm. if, if somebody would sell you a fight, you have the right not to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with that. So when I will answer this, it's at the same time, I don't know how to frame it, but I hear you. The elites are responsible to create, I usually call it, a society that is producing solution. At the same time, the elites, the now leaders, th they can shape a society that creates problems. Unfortunately, in Kurdistan, in MENA region in general, and its relative, we have elites in different levels are making it complicated. For a normal living standards, they, it's, it's, it's like even they sit, how can we make it more complicated for an individual, <laughs> for the citizen? It's really weird. And their responsibility is to make it easier as much as they can. But at the same time, you would find homeless people in the United States, in the capital that the people are dying to get to it, in France, in the UK, you would find poor people, people who failed. So they have a society that is haven for us, right? I wouldn't call those places havens but, necessarily. But, but at least this is the perception of our people. Right. People are like, I'm ready to sacrifice everything just to go there. And they would go there and we say, it's not that easy what I, I was thinking. So what I'm trying to say is you take, a person would take his, her failure and success with themselves, with the skills, attitude that they have. Again, am I saying that it's, it's all, each individual is a separate island? Definitely no. It's a responsibility, huge responsibility. And it's a sin for the elites that are not trying to give hope to their nation. It's shame on them if they will not try to create a society that make the people, living of people, easier. And I think also, and I'd actually like to pivot a little bit and talk about sort of your own background and your own upbringing, because I think, again, the issue with, the elites in the society is that they don't have the same problems that the youth have. There's, they talk past each other a lot of the time. And I'm curious what kind of issues you grew up with that don't exist anymore or have shifted and changed. Uh, so my age and the, the youth. Your age. Your oh, age. yeah? <laughs> <laughs> not, as, you're not your age. I mean, if you want to give me your age, that's fine. But I'm curious about your own upbringing. So what, one of the things, for example... Uh, there was, it was not that easy to have a communication with decision makers. There were no enough platforms to talk. The choices were much, much less. Uh, less. The, the, the openness to the internal and external society. Uh, I born in 1968, December. I'll do the math later. Okay, so 53 years. <laughs> the first time that I had the passport and have the privilege to, to, to travel abroad was 2004, Jordan first training for my for me so imagine so a person lived all this life we did not have the right to go out now it's it's different the the public schools universities it's the, it's the level of changes and even skill wise that the opportunity for a person to learn english any other skill it's getting changing a lot of those things go change and the opportunities till an extent maybe it's 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 over choice and this also may be one of the reasons of not being happy. All in all, all in all, what we try to understand, I think, uh, uh, democracy is about giving the will of the people to shape their own life on different levels. So at least now we have the room of maneuver, try to do something. For dictatorship it was, and this why in some of my trainings, especially in the Arab Spring in different countries, I was starting with, because I was training on leadership. I was starting with this question. Which one is easier for a citizen to live in a dictator society or a democratic ones? So sometimes the people were getting it in a mistaking way. Uh, so do you like dictatorship or democracy? And I was like, no, which one is easier? All in all, it, it, there might be a lot of discussion, but all in all, it, it might be easier for a person to guide me and some levels, ah, khalas, yani. he will order and I will implement. There are their challenges, definitely. But the more challenge in the democratic society is not that easy. Solutions will not come from sky. 
you need to be proactive, go there, participate, raise your voice, and there will be suffering for it. And learn to be a society that thrives in complication. Exactly, because yeah. it's it's about all those talks. And it's very easy for me, for example, if I will be your manager, I will decide and you will listen. I know there might be some minds, but we will get very fast to decisions. I will say you implement, but with democracy, I need to ask your opinion and you will give me, and it will take hours to decide and maybe it, we will not get to that result. It will take time, energy, mood, mentality, stress, etc. But the process worth it, in fact. And this is what we need to get for our young generation. They need to be there and be ready to it, to up to a level that can affect. And this is one of the messages to the youth. If you want to be effective, you need to work on yourself for your work to be listened to. It's not enough just because you have the bachelor degree in law, for example, that you would be effective. That was the previous era in a, in a, in a dictatorship government, let us say. But now it's an open market. You are an international citizen. Just having a bachelor degree as certificate with no strong skills, let us say, will not take you anywhere, let us say, somehow, relatively. But you need to be strong enough to have more weight that when you talk, people would know, oh, we need to listen to him. Otherwise, there might be other complications. So let me pivot real quick to Rwanda as an organization. And so we've talked so much about communicating to youth responsibility. What kind of programs do you have that encourage that and use that messaging? So one of those is to focus on the skills. We have three main strategies. One of them is to provide direct services, which is the less, but sometimes it's needed in different uh, fields. And we mainly focus on capacity building because about the 21st century skills, how to be international citizens, to be already there in internally and locally and internationally, and then designing policies. And we have not that much, but also enter that field to design some policies because it will, uh, it's not, uh, as the saying was saying, uh, it's it's better, uh, better than feed the fish, teach them how to fish. So designing the policies is beyond this also, that you create, again, a society, at least on a legal uh, basement, let us say, in order not to repeat the same problems. Uh, lately, we try to bridge between decision makers and children. We have a pro new initiative we call this Message from Children. So annually and from an entry point of drawing. So the children of the primary school, they will, under one theme, send a message and we through drawing and we will hang it in a wall in the parliament. And for the first year, which will be... Uh, this year and tomorrow is the event. It's about uh, loving your country. Mm -hmm. So in each year we'll have a theme and they will draw and uh, we will have 50 best from all schools, primary schools, and we'll hang it there. At least it will be there for the decision how, how will they will see it. So maybe one day we will ask them, how do you see the politicians in Kurdistan? And we will see what type of pictures would come. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have the job fair to bridge between uh, decision, uh, sorry, the job seekers and job uh, providers. To create the, the culture of, uh, of volunteerism, we have the Youth Volunteer Initiative. Uh, it's a call for youth if they wanted to increase their victory record. And we have a lot of those youth. We, yes, we talked about the general sin that they want to leave, et cetera, and uh, hopelessness. But there are others also, in fact. And we want those stories to be there to shed the light on them and say, in the same situation, we have people who still have the faith, try to do something, but they need support. Ask not what your Kurdistan can do for you. Ask what you can do for your Kurdistan. True, very true. <laughs> Which is a quote that I've always hated. Uh, I think it started from the United... Yeah, it's from uh, JFK. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Kak Abdul Salam, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much again to Abdul Salam Mandane for a very energized and passionate discussion. Uh, since I was so adamant about not listing out Romangus programs in this interview, I've gone ahead and included a link uh, to the organization's page below. They have some really fantastic programs that I would recommend checking out. Uh, stuff on volunteerism, uh, their environmental work uh, is fantastic. So if you'd like to check that out, uh, link is below. Uh, if you'd like to check out more info about Inside Kurdistan, uh, you can also check out kurdistanin.net. That link is below as well. And be sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app. Uh, if it exists, we're on it. Thanks for listening once again. 
I've been Aaron Weintraub, and this has been Inside Kurdistan. Inside Kurdistan.